And because the salary cap's going up at such a strong rate, it's 8% say each year, when you push that money into the future, you know that, that dollar is gonna be worth a lot less in two years time when the cap might be 15, 18, 19% more. And so by pushing out, they're just able to spend loads of money. All right, guys, welcome back to Net Worth. I am your host, Justin Pugh. We have an awesome guest today. But before we get into that, I want to remind you to like this video, subscribe to the channel. Thank you for everyone that's been leaving us comments, responding to our tweets. We've been using those to help shape our shows. But coming up next, we are welcome, welcoming the Brownie fans to the Net Worth family, and we're glad to have you guys here. I am becoming a bigger and bigger Browns fan by the day, which is going to make my guests even happier. Today, we have on Jack Duffin, Browns fan cap expert based in the UK, writer for the Orange and Brown Report. Jack's specialty is roster building, free agency, understanding the salary cap, following the money, which is what we love here on this show. And the way I understand it, Jack, is you became a Browns fan because you were a fan of Andrew Barry in the Browns current front office. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? And welcome to the show. Yeah. So thanks for having me on. Um, it's one where first, first ever NFL gamer threw on. I was out in Florida on holiday as a kid. It was New England versus Miami. And I was like, hey, I'll, I'll support the team of England in their name. <laughs> why, why not? It, it kind of makes sense. And then after they kept winning and it was like, well, I don't just want to be one of these fans that just I didn't pick them because they're winning. I had no idea what I was doing when I first turned on a game. Um, but I was like, I'm looking for another team. Loved Moneyball. And then when Paul D. Podesta joined the Browns, I'm like, that's it. I'm a Browns fan. We then won one game in the next two years. And I was contemplating if I made the wrong decision. But so you uh, went from hey. the Patriots that had just won. What, what year is this when you saw the Patriots play? Oh, I'd have been a kid. So this would have been ages, ages, ages ago. Um, 20 odd years no 20 yeah sort of like 15 years so the, ago, like. so the beginning of the brady era like they were winning super bowls they're about to go on this historic run and you jump ships for maybe the best team to ever play football to the cleveland browns which is maybe the complete opposite trajectory at the time that must have felt like you know you you the, the worst decision you could have made at the time. But now looking back, I mean, I think it's it's provided the life and, and some of the things you're interested in. But that's a, a, a risky bet you made. Yeah, no, it's one of those things that it was like, I just didn't want to be like, oh, you're a Patriots fan because they always win. It was like, no, but I looked for another answer. I didn't, yeah, I'll hold my hands up. That was kind of the point where I was getting a lot more into the NFL. I did not know what I'd just let myself in for. Exactly. Now, did you... That was your your intake to that. Did you play any other sports growing up or were you into athletics or how did football, an American football, if that, we're going to talk about the other football here in a second, but has that always been a passion of yours or just seeing that one game is what sparked the interest? It was purely something that interests me as sport, played a load of Madden. So I honestly played more Madden than I ever watched the game for years and years and years. And then started playing fantasy football with a few mates and that kind of really got me into the sport. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. When I started taking active interest, it was um, watching games. And it, it's weird because you've got a primetime game, which is great for everyone in the States. In the UK, that's like one in the morning. So it's a real slog, some of those games where you're like, all right, I'll get three hours sleep and then I'll watch the game and then I'll get three hours sleep and then I'll go to work. Um, but no, you, you really just mix it up and fit in as many games as you can get. So if you're a football fan in the UK, you are the most dedicated fan of them all because you're up at one o'clock in the morning watching these games sometimes. That is commitment on another level. I don't think anyone in the States even realizes that. That's unbelievable. When I was on holiday um, last year in California and it was like, oh, there's, there's a game and it's like in the morning it, it just completely threw my clock out and it was like oh it's a prime time game I'll watch it after the day's done and it was like 7 30 it's like I just could not get my head around the times because uh I can sort of I semi adjust to eastern time because I'm so used to interacting with Browns fans once I was on the other coast I was like this makes no sense at all um just kind of roll with it I grew up on the East Coast, grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, played in New York. I've been an East Coast guy my entire life. I now live in Arizona with, uh, you know, when I went and played for the Arizona Cardinals, 
you get to watch primetime games out here at five o'clock, six o'clock in the evening, then go have your dinner after watch. It is the best time zone to watch football. It seems like you are in the worst time zone to be a fan of American football. I love our Sundays. So I have the whole Sunday to do whatever I want. And then six o'clock in the evening, the first game comes along, nine o'clock. And then it's like, I can go to bed, end of that game. The frustration is that Sunday primetime game is usually the best one of the week. And it's yeah. like, it's perfect for sort of the, the if you're on East Coast, or the one o'clock and sort of just gone four o'clock slate. But yeah, the primetime games is a nightmare. But I do really like having the whole Sunday to go out and do whatever I want. And then it's the end of the day six o'clock pop the NFL on is there. That's a nice time. So I've get the benefit of the, where well, there's all the games going on, but yeah, prime time is a nightmare. Well, I'll circle back to the UK and, and, and Europe as a whole and football. I have a couple of questions there, but going back to the other football and the football of where you are from, when you, when you say, when you're talking about it, do you call it soccer? Do you call it football? How do you, cause I'm sure everyone's like, what do you do for work? And what, what do you say when they ask you that question? Yeah. So, um, I call it American football and then it's football if I'm talking about here. So I, I, I grit my teeth when I'm on American shows and I, I use the S word soccer, but it's, it's semi gritted teeth. Yeah, I, I totally understand. I, I, I grew up, I have a little bit of ignorance, but I saw on your page that you're doing some kind of crowdfunding ownership for a football team, your, your football in, uh, in the UK right now. Can you talk, talk about that? Yeah. So it was one where about six months ago, the local... I'll use the soccer word, the local soccer team um, that I go and watch. So the eighth tier of English football, they got, they went into liquidation. So the club shut down, um, which is gutting. It's like, that's the team that you go and watch each week. Um, and you're only talking about 100, 200 fans going to games, but it, it's a really, really good atmosphere and a massive part of the community. And then it's just gone overnight. Um, so we got together as fans and we went, actually, let's, create a hundred percent fan run club, super transparent, super democratic. So our owners get to vote on all sorts of stuff from the kit to where we play, um, who's running the club, loads of stuff. Um, and we just email out like the finances are transparent to the level of like everything we spend in a week. We just send an email to our owners going, Hey, this is what's been spent. And yeah, we're just setting that up. So it can be as little as sort of $6 a month to $60 a year is, is sort of to become an owner. And that's just something that we wanted to recreate something in the community that's there, but we thought let's do this differently. And it's been a massive success. We, we set an early goal of, can we get a hundred owners? And um, by the time we are going to play our first sort of competitive game in August, and we managed to do it in 22 days. Um, and that wow. launched in January. So it's a really, really fun. Um, it's completely different. So the team is playing right now. Like the team that you you've reestablished a team, you brought them back, you brought them through the liquidation process and they're actually playing games. So we'll play our first game soon. So August will be the first competitive game. Um we launched in January as a legal entity. Um, but no, it's it's all setting up and coming towards fruition. I've literally on my, my dining room table, I have a box of footballs. Um it, it's proper startup. Um, business atmosphere. But uh, yeah, it, it's all voluntary. No one's getting any money out of it. It all goes and stays within the club, but it's just fun. Um, it's all of those computer games that you might have played as a kid from FIFA to Madden. It's like, no, forget that. We're just doing this in real life. And uh, yeah. No, I fun. love it. I love it. And all my followers, we're going to I'm gonna have to send them to your page. We'll link it right here. If we want to put a little net worth contingency, maybe I'll throw a couple bucks in here and we'll all invest in the team. I, I would love to own a little piece, not like uh, the big time guys like the Ryan Reynolds of the world, but uh, I think it would be a cool story. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. But let's jump into why we're here in the episode. And I kind of want to set the table with our our listeners and our viewers. We're going to talk a little bit today about the Browns, their spending habits, their roster building habits, and under how, under this current regime, how it is so unique. Then I have some general free agency questions. I kind of mentioned to them, to you offline before. Obviously, I played for the New York Giants for the last few years and Arizona Cardinals. So I may ask for a take on some of those free agency moves. There is a, there is a few big moves they made that I think you might have a, uh, have some insight on. Does that, that sound good? Yeah, no, sounds great. All right, perfect. Well, let's kick it off with the reason why we're here. The Cleveland Browns, the Brownie fans. I want to give a quick shout out, obviously, to Andrew Barry, Jimmy Haslam. I think, is there a better GM, 
ownership combo than what the Browns have right now. I know the Eagles probably are up there, but who else would be in that conversation? Yeah. Uh, it's, it, Eagles are number one. They are the uh, the blueprint of what you want. And th- they've done lots uh, of stuff. The Eagles, you know, it's that I grew up in Philadelphia. I grew up a fan of the Eagles, but now playing for the Giants. It, it pains me to see that, but I, I know Howie and, and, and Jeffrey Loy are unbelievable. But it's lots of GMs might have taken the risks that um, Howie's done and they would just get sacked. And it's the when your owner's got confidence in you to really push the edges and they're able to do trades where they're getting picks one, two years in advance, how he doesn't mind because he's like, hey, I'll be the GM then. I can pick the players in two years' time. Whereas you've got other players, other teams that are like, we need the picks this year because I might be fired next year. And that kind of ownership, GM dynamic, that can really pay dividends because you can play a longer game. You can look at the really big picture and that's something that comes with time. And We've seen a lot of regimes in Cleveland, and it feels weird that we're talking about Cleveland and continuity. Um, those words just don't normally go together. No, that's that's brilliant. It's it's almost like the NFL is caught up in, hey, what have you done for me lately? And, and with players, we feel that. With coaches, we feel that pressure. But what you're saying is look at the model of the teams that have had the most success, having a 10 year plan or maybe maybe not as ten, long as 10, maybe a five year plan and allowing that GM to, to see that through is, is probably the best way. So Carolina Panthers, if you're listening, stop firing everybody every year and let's start giving these guys a chance. Um, so, so we have the Browns, we, we have the Eagles at the top. We have the Browns right there at second and, and ascending, trying to overtake that spot. Who else is up there? I'd say the Ravens definitely deserve to be around there. Um, they've had a really, really good regime for many years. Um, and that it was always tough with that when you have your GM retire of like, what does that continuity look like? And the Steelers went through it as well. It was like, does the whole thing fall apart? And we've seen it to probably reference UK soccer, if anyone follows that, with like Sir Alex Ferguson and Man United when he was there and the whole club is built around him as an individual. You pull him out and it falls like a house of cards. And that might be something we see in New England with Bill Belichick leaves. Does it create a giant void and it all goes wrong? Or is it one that other people can step up? But the Ravens are definitely one. And and it pains me to say that, that they're in the division and they're really well run. There is a lot of good run teams in the AFC is it's like, I'd love to almost just trade the Browns to the NFC and there, there'd be, there'd be more chance of playoff success and everything that comes with it. Exactly. And, and how did you gain this interest? How did you become such a expert in the cap? I mean, you have guys like Eric Eager who are, have PhDs in mathematics, giving you shout outs and articles. And that's how I found your page. And I was so enamored with how you broke down the cap. How did you even like, I know you heard, you read Moneyball, you saw the game, but how did you decide to dive, you know, full in on this? Yeah. So with sort of UK soccer, you can just go out and buy guys. There's no real, there's nothing like the salary cap. They're sort of trying to bring in some financial fair play stuff, but it doesn't really work. So the teams can just do what they want. And if they want to go spend a load of money, they can. And that's kind of what, interested me most about the NFL. It was like, well, there's there's a funnel of players coming in through the draft. They're all cost controlled. So you've got that from a really fixed area of, you know, you can bring these guys in and what they're going to cost over sort of three, four years. Um, and then through the salary cap and everything there. And that kind of really just fascinated me because roster building, when I'm playing Madden, I, I almost spend as much time setting up the team in the first half of what I'm doing versus I then play through the games and I'm like, right, now we're back to the team and who do we want to go and add? And adding this guy, what does it mean for that position? So it interests me. And then I searched around and there was some great stuff. Jason Fitzgerald over the cap is phenomenal what they provide. Um, And they've got a great book on sort of everything with the last CBA, all the really, the detailed nitty gritty stuff and what that actually means. Um, But then it was kind of looking out there and it was like, well, I can't really find much, not much exclusively on the Browns. So I I thought, well, I may as well just start digging in, asking people. And the whole sort of internet community is insane that you can just ask people and they're like, oh yes, this, this, and this. And it's like, oh great. And you're just learning and picking stuff up. So it was kind of just, I couldn't find anyone doing it. So I thought, well, I may as well do it. And it's just grown and grown from there. And that's where you've kind of taken to Twitter. Is that the main platform that you operate on? 100%. It purely grew off of, I was tweeting random stuff and 
it was early on, people really didn't like what I was tweeting because it was like, hey, there, there's issues and potential problems coming out here. And it's like, you don't really want to spend that much on that player. And then as the Browns got more aggressive, people go from like, I wish that guy would shut up to tell us more, tell us more about how the Browns are going to lead the league in spending. So it can really go through swings of like, we don't want to hear what you're saying to, oh, th this is really good. We, we want some more of that. So it's educating people on the salary cap as well, because there's lots of sort of vague stuff that doesn't really make sense. And when you strip it back to just focus on the cash, focus on how much money is going to the players, because if you strip it down, what's a negotiation between the GM or whoever on the team side and the agent and the player is how much money they're going to get and what's guaranteed. They're, they're not going to worry whether it's, oh, how much proration is in the number because why does that matter? It's it's literally the the nerdy accounting part is what pe lots of people focus on. Whereas if you actually just focused on the, the guarantees and how much cash is getting handed over, it all tends to make a lot more sense. And this has allowed you, and I, I've dove into Brown's Twitter. I don't know if there's a term for it. The dog pound. I know, I know all those things. And I feel like I've become an honorary dog pound member um, through this process because I'm seeing you talk about predictions and who we should sign. And more often than not, you're hitting on who the Browns should bring in. So now are you this Oracle that the Browns need to bring around? Like, are, are you in talks with the Browns to go move to Cleveland and be involved? How, how far have we gone down that path? I've, I've joked with some people in the team that can one of them sneak into Andrew Berry's office and see if like my free agent cheat sheet is on the wall. So uh, they, they haven't reported back, but I did ask the question. Um, and I've well, also you know, joked, will you know they pay I'll, me yeah, not yeah, exactly. to release the list? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'll do? I want to give a quick shout out to three guys on the team that I know and, 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 and worked with and you don't have to give me, you don't even have to give me your take on them, but these maybe could be some of our insiders. The first one's Jordan Hicks, one of my best friends in the NFL, unbelievable linebacker. I think he's a great addition to that team. What he did in Arizona, he should have been a Cardinal for the rest of his life. We let him walk out the door, went to Minnesota. I think the same mistake happened in Minnesota and you guys are getting a dog, like literally a dog. And now he's the dog pound. I think it is a perfect fit. And then maybe there isn't a more of a, grinder out there than Wyatt Teller. We have the same agent. I've seen Wyatt go from, you know, a low, uh, you know, low on the totem pole in Buffalo to the best guard in football. And when I say best guard in the football, then I'm like, oh God, I'm disrespecting maybe the left guard who maybe is the best guard in football. Those three guys, Joel Batonio, Wyatt Teller, Jordan Hicks, a couple unsung heroes. A few have been there for a while. Jordan will assume that role going forward. So just want to give a shout out to those guys. Maybe they can go. I'll, I'll, I'll message them on your behalf and say, hey, can we sneak into uh, Andrew Barry's office and see if there's, you know, a, a, a shrine to you there? No, it's one that Jordan Hicks was a signing that I really liked him on paper. So um, as we came into the offseason, it was like there's 633 um, unrestricted free agents. So I was like, right, let's just put them on a list. And if I'm Andrew Berry, I'm looking at each of them. Is it a yes, no? And why is it a yes, no? Um, and really starting from that exercise of, well, that's how you get down to a list of like, who's in, who's out, and who do I think they'll look at? And some guys like, oh, this guy's really good, but he's going to cost too much. They're not going to spend that on a, another edge or something because you've got Miles Garrett and I thought they'd bring Smith back. Um, and it's just weighing up each bit. But Jordan Hicks was a player I was like, I really want Jordan Hicks. Do they spend four and a half million of cash on another linebacker if they're going to extend Joe OK? And that was kind of the question. If, if Joe OK is getting extended now, probably not. And that might be one now where they push that Joe OK decision until next off season, let him test the market and get a sense of what his value is. Um, and the guard tandem, it, it was one that Joel Batonio has just been insane how good he is. And I think Cleveland Brown fans love him. If they wouldn't have had Joe Thomas stood right next to him, I think they'd have a whole nother level of respect for him because it, it overshadows a too strong a word, but it's like you're a potential Hall of Fame left guard and you play next to like the greatest left tackle ever. It's a weird combo to have and it's tough for whoever the left tackle's coming in. So Jedrick Wills, um, he gets painted as this really, really bad left tackle and it's like, he's just league average. But the trouble is, Everyone who's a Cleveland Browns fan just goes, well, he's not good as Joe Thomas. And it's like, that that's not really fair on any individual coming in. Um, and Wyatt Teller is one that didn't quite play last season to the high levels he has in sort of the two, three years before. But 
there's been a drop off with injuries and niggling stuff in the second half, whereas so much more consistent last year. And the advantage the Browns have got is they paid these guys two years ago. Yep. Um, and the guard market went wild this off season. Um, guys are getting massive, massive deals. And where it was last year, there was a bit of noise. Would they trade him? What's going on? Now you're looking at 14 million for a that's not that sort of just below Pressure elite. Line. Yeah. Upper echelon, yeah, guard. And you're like, that's a bargain. Um, and that's kind of the identify players early, throw money at them, tie them in for a few years. Like Miles Garrett, it's on 25 million a year. And it's like, if you want to go for, sign an edge for 25 million a year, you're getting a, a good one, but you're not getting the best in the market. You, Bosa's 34 million a year. Um, it's mad how quick it escalates. It's it's insane. Obviously, as a player that's still on the market right now, I'm still a free agent. I don't think I was on your list of guys that we probably need to bring in, but um, that's all right. That's all right. What I really wanted to to jump into was the article that you wrote, um, how the Cleveland Browns spending is sustainable and other teams won't like it. The reason I want to talk about this and what caught my eye is the Cleveland Browns are spending substantially more in cash every year than every NFL team. So in my opinion, it's like, that's why they can have a Joel Batonio, a Wyatt Teller on the field. They're spending 30, 40 million. That's like three or four pro bowlers more on the field than any other team. So let's dive into that. And I guess the first conversation we have to have is what is the difference between cash spend and cap accounting? Yeah. So cash is how much goes to the player in a particular year. So if you sign for a team and you're getting $11 million in a year, um, and the reason why I use 11 is, is so much easier to calculate this part. If I give you 11 million, we could call that base salary and then cash and cap equal the same thing. But what the Browns would do is they'd give you 11 million and they'd do 1 million as base salary, which probably around the league minimum, it varies slightly. And they'd do 10 million as signing bonus. And what that's going to do on the salary cap is year one is only going to account for 3 million on the cap. And then that other 8 million just gets pushed into the future. And because the salary cap's going up at such a strong rate, it's roughly about sort of 8%, say, each year. They obviously went a bit astray with COVID and stuff, but I think it will probably get back to around 8%. When you push that money into the future, it's not like you're pushing it into the future and your earnings aren't going up. You're pushing it into the future and you know that that dollar is going to be worth a lot less in two years' time when the cap might be 15, 18, 19% more. And so by pushing out, they're just able to spend loads of money. And some teams, say, take the Bengals that are in our division as an example, they just don't have a cash rich owner. And that's not, you're wealthy if you own an NFL team, but there's different levels of cash wealth. Is your money tied up in because you own a team? Or is it there because you've got all this vast, cash and however it is placed in your business. And you can just funnel that into the team. And the Browns are in a really, really lucky position that they've got a cash rich owner. And because of that, they can just go out and spend so much more money and just to put into sort of um, scale for how much that is. So over the last three years, using the NFL PA data, the average team in the NFL spent 627 million on across the three years as total. The Browns led the league with 757 and a half million. So that's an extra 43 million a year. But when you're talking about sort of 200 millions average and the Browns are spending 240, um, that is a, that's a sizable chunk. It's not like a small amount of money. You're adding on like an extra 20, 30% onto your budget. So that, that just opens up doors. When you spend 20% more, you're able to miss on draft picks. You can just strengthen. And people get frustrated with the Browns when they don't have like a $10 million player in every single starting position. And that's kind of what the expectations got with to fans, where it's like, oh, why don't we have a the top guard? Why don't we have the top this? And that that's they've just been spoiled effectively, um, if you, to put it one way. And if you look at a team like the Chiefs, it's like, hey, we have the highest paid quarterback, tight end, and defensive tackle. And cornerback now, if, if Sneed stays around. But then besides that, it's like we have rookies everywhere else. We have minimum salaries. The Chiefs kind of are on this outlier. So I think a lot of people at times, they look at the Chiefs and like, well, why can't we do that? 
Well, they have probably one of the best GMs in football. They have maybe arguably the best coach in football and arguably Patrick Mahomes will go down as a top, you know, right now you probably put him in your top five of all time, what he's able to accomplish. He is already on that path of chasing down Tom Brady, which is crazy to say. He's not there yet. He has to stay healthy for a whole lot more years, but the the Chiefs aren't a model that you can build and is sustainable because you have to have those, those three. How is the Browns model sustainable? I'm grateful, though, that the Chiefs aren't using the Browns model because it would go from winning every other Super Bowl to winning every Super Bowl. If if you then took that Chiefs team and went, we're going to spend another 50 million a year on this roster. Yeah, g- good luck for the rest of the NFL. It's just, it's going to be a spectator sport for So Chiefs teams. fans, please turn off right now. We don't want to give you any more insight on how to make this work. But I guess for a team like the New York Giants and the media market that is the the, the New York media, I look at it from a perspective of like, why isn't a team like the Giants looking at this model or, or the the insert insert team, Stephen Ross and the Miami Dolphins, who probably has unlimited funds to do things like this? Why aren't teams spending like the Browns are? Yeah, so I think you've got to have a, some key pieces in place because you don't want to be going to free agency and going, hey, we're going to spend all this money. And then in a year's time, all these players are off the books. You want to have those fundamental core pieces. So there's question marks over whether the quarterback's the guy. I'm not going to get into that today, but there's a, there's a quarterback getting 46 million a year in cash. You've got the likes of Miles Garrett. You've got the guard combo. You've got Denzel Ward at corner. You've got several pieces. And where you can spread those contracts over like eight years with some of the Miles Garrett's going to be here for a long time in Cleveland, you can just set the book and know that, hey, we like when Patrick Mahomes signed a 10-year deal, they know exactly every dollar that's going on with your course back for a long time can really project forward. So it's having sort of a, a young core you can build on and that stability from the front office because you can't, can't change this plan over every year. You've got to keep a lot of that core together. But they're just paying guys and knowing effectively in two years time, the salary cap that's how much they're spending. So because the salary cap keeps going up up and you've got confidence in that going up, you can spend the budget that is in two years time. And then when that catches up, well, you're already spending because in two years time, it's going to be even higher. And it's just constantly pushing that number out. Um, And it's, it's a calculated model. You can't just turn it off and turn it on different years. You've got to have the buy-in from the owner to go, actually, we need a cash budget that's going to be the salary cap in two years' time, and you're going to have to keep giving us that. Um, and there's only sort of two things that could really screw it up. One's the owner just goes, no, nah, I'm not going to do this anymore, which is not going to be brutal, but you're going to have to slowly bring it down. If you were to have another sort of pandemic level event where the salary cap went down, screwed, it was like the politest way I can put it on the podcast it would be a disaster because you already set your salary cap hits for the next two, three years. So you can't just go, oh yeah, we're going to change course. And it's not one way you can't get rid of bad players. Once their contract's done, you can turn over sort of two, three sort of big 10 million a year players each year. You couldn't just go, hey, we're paying six, uh, 12 guys, say 10 million plus. We're just going to get rid of six of them this year. You've got to plan this thing out in advance. Um, and that's something that, Hey, Andrew Berry is a very, very smart guy. And there is lots of smart individuals in that front office. And they're able to plan things like when Quezzi um, Doffamensa went to the Vikings, he was saying, I'm going to miss chatting to Andrew Berry about comp picks in like four years time, because they're sat there talking about that level of detail. So it's a very efficient level of planning. But the fact that you can spend 43 million is their average over three years, more than every other team, well, the average, sorry, not every other team, then that's how you're going. It doesn't matter if we've got a couple of misses in here. It doesn't matter if we're carrying sort of a player that doesn't quite pay up to his level. You build in sort of um, an element of missing. And it's why when lots of teams, they lose their quarterback, they get injuries, they're picking top five. The Browns went to the playoffs. It wasn't sort of, lots of people pin it on Joe Flacco and his miraculous rise. If they had 50 million ripped out of that roster, it would have been sort of losses all the way down the stretch. It would have been a bloodbath. So I think Flacco was the biggest recipient of of this strategy because he had the team around him to go win a Super Bowl. And that's why I always go back to 
you look at the majority of teams, and I have this philosophy that you should never pay a quarterback over 15% of the salary cap because then you just can't surround him with the necessary talent. You may win one Super Bowl having a, a, a roster like that, but for what the Chiefs to do, what they've done, I don't want to keep talking about the Chiefs. We don't listen, Chiefs fans. Stop listening. But uh, if they were to adopt this model, it would be it would be dangerous. So really, the biggest obstacle here is a black swan event that would prevent the salary cap from going up. And I guess the, the opposite of this example is a team that's tried to do this and maybe has missed on is a team like the New Orleans Saints. Is that fair to say where they've tried to pay these young core players that maybe haven't panned out like they thought? Yeah, so I'd love to delve back and go really deep in the data, but they've been the lowest spender over the last three years. And we hear all this magic that they do at the salary cap deadlines to move a lot of money around. I think a lot of that's probably caused by what happened with the pandemic and they just, it's going to take a long, long time to clear your books. And almost it'd be painful for a fan base to do. The best way to probably do it would just be to absolutely tank one year and just go, we need a hard reset. Um, but that's that can be really challenging for a front office and a coaching staff to do because they might say, we want to do this. And then they both get fired and the new people that come in then get to take it forward. Um, and that's one that we spoke about the Eagles earlier and other teams where you've got continuity from a front office and leadership in the team. That is so important because you'll have times where things go wrong. If you want to reset that just puts everything back around because when you bring in a new head coach, you bring in a new GM, they want to bring in their guys. They don't want to just go, oh, I'm going to continue business as usual. You've got to reset. And it takes a couple of years to get into the model of like what the Browns are doing. You can't just go, hey, we're going to go spend 120% of sort of the cap on our players and we'll roll forward. You've got to sort of get the players in place and it takes some time. So what Sashi Brown did to the Browns several years ago with, hey, let's trade down, let's almost tank, um, bring in lots of guys, get the high picks, whether it's your Miles Garrett's, Baker didn't work out, but Denzel Ward did. That set them on the trajectory where they could go and do this a lot cleaner. Um, but it's one where other teams can take part of this. But if you're, tanking's too strong a word, but if you know you're resetting- Not too strong of a word, it's just what it is. People just don't like to hear it because they think- Oh, that's that's not fair play. It is fair play. You're you're giving away a year of uh, on the field production to try to sustain for ten years. I I think the Cardinals are doing that at the current moment. The Arizona Cardinals. I've said it, but uh, people get mad because no one will say the tanking word because the, the league will step in and say that's not fair. And it's one that as soon as you get a great quarterback, you're set. So like, you look at the Texans. The Texans are now set for the next decade because they've got the quarterback. It's like you can sort of work everything else around it and you you just need a quarterback and because people go, oh, the Browns haven't had success. They've spent all this money. Why does it matter? And it's like, well, the Chiefs, we'll keep coming back to the Chiefs. The Chiefs could be horrendous at roster building and salary cap management. They've got Patrick Mahomes. Does it really matter? They took Clyde Edward Solaire over T Higgins and it was like, oh, we've got no holes on the roster. So we took the running back and it's like, no, you might think you don't have holes, but let's just look ahead to a year where people are leaving and what's going on. Just keep taking the premium positions and it'll work out. And if you have too many wide receivers, someone will give you an absolute haul in a trade to take one of them off your hands. So uh, just keep adding more and more expensive players and then profit down the line. Well, speaking of haul for receivers, I feel like the Browns just somehow get receivers for not the same asking price as everybody else. So maybe let's jump into the most recent trade, the the Jerry Judy trade, and talk me through that and your thoughts on it. I know he restructured today. We have a lot of Browns news today. I mean, you have some coaching news we'll hop into as well. But walk me through that scenario. How are the Browns and Amari Cooper's another one where I saw a comparison today, Amari Cooper versus Calvin Ridley. How are the Browns getting guys like Jerry Judy? We'll talk about him first and then Amari Cooper. Yeah, so I think one of the reasons they knew they had to go after Jerry Judy or something else is free agency is an open market where we're always going to do this. The Chiefs, a perfect example. You're up against the Chiefs for wide receivers and you're saying, hey, we've got Amari Cooper, so you can come join the Browns, but you're never going to be number one on this team as the wide receiver and favorite target. Whereas the Chiefs are like, yeah, we've got Travis Kelsey, a bit old. If you want to come here on a prove it deal, play with the best quarterback in the league, We'll elevate your value and you can cash in in a year's time. You're just, 
Shout it's out not to Hollywood. A level shout out to my former teammate Hollywood Brown, who just is. I think it was a brilliant move by him. He's going to go take that deal, make eleven million maybe next year, up up to eleven, and then he's going to get broke off because he's going to be running down the sidelines like Tariq for that team. Oh, and he's either going to get a really great extension off of the Chiefs, or he's going to get an insane deal in a year's time. And it's like, where do you want to go? You want to go and play with the best quarterback in the league see your value go through the roof. And and that's why the Browns probably knew if they wanted a wide receiver, it's just not going to happen. They could get sort of several tiers down, but they're not going to be in that top market. So they went out and went for the trade market and they brought in Jerry Judy, who I saw a comparison with him and Pittman. And it's surprisingly not much in the difference of, I think Pittman's had like 600 extra receiving yards. When you think, I think Pittman, I'm like, I would give him bags and bags of money if he was on the market. Whereas Jerry Judy is, is sort of seen as like, All right, is he that good? Is it just talent that hasn't delivered? So I'm really excited to see what he's going to do. And this fact that they gave away two late picks, it's not the end of the world, but you can control the trade market because Jerry Judy has a choice to retire or play for the Cleveland Browns. Whereas when you've got 32 teams bidding for you, it's a really competitive choice of where they go. Um, so no, I think they've done a great job of bringing him in. They've got three wide receivers that they've all traded for. So Cooper, you've got um, Elijah Moore and you've got Jerry Judy. They're all free agents after this year. So they can just see what happens. And if two of them are great, they can pay two of them in a year's time. If only one of them's great, they'll pay one. But give yourself as many options. And it wouldn't surprise me if they go out and draft one highly. So you could have three legit guys who are starting a second round pick, a third round pick, maybe another second round pick as your sort of three depth guys. Throw as much at the wall and see what sticks because at the end of the year, they can extend guys, they can trade guys off. They're operating from a position of strength. Now, with Jerry Judy's restructuring today, you're going to know more about it than I would. How does that play into, oh, he's going to be part of our long-term plans. When you restructure a guy, it kind of means like we see you being here for some time. How did that work out? Can you explain that restructure to us? Yeah, so he was due to make just under 13 million um, and he will still make that money. So there's belief that restructures alters anything. In terms of what a player gets, it doesn't change anything. It's usually on the same payment schedule. The same money goes into the player's bank account. So cash not affected in terms of the year. What it does change is just the accounting mechanism. So rather than that sort of 13 million that was base salary, it's down to the minimum. So 1.125 uh, million. And then just under 12 million of it is signing bonus. And that just splits equally into each year. So rather than it would have been 13 million on the cap, it's about 3.5 million. But then what's going to happen next year, even if he's not on the team, if he's not on the team and he leaves, they just deal with that nine and a half million in a year's time. But again, it's just pushing that problem into tomorrow. And because the salary cap goes up, it just goes. If you knew that you had a job that, you had a guaranteed 8% increase for every year for the rest of your life, you'd happily book a holiday on a credit card and go, don't worry, I can pay for this in a year's time because I know my salary is going up. And that's almost what dead cap is. People freak out about dead cap. But if you know that if you go on holiday and you pay for the holiday now on your card, but you have to clear the debt when you're back, that's the same as dead cap. It's the same money you've spent. You just know that, hey, you do a pay increase, you've maybe got a bonus coming down the line. You can just pay for it in a few months' time. That's the same way. People view it as a really bad thing, but dead cap and just pushing that bill into the future, as long as you've got a spending model to pay for it and cover it, it's not a bad thing. So really smart what they're doing and they should restructure everyone, pushes that yeah. money into next year. And even if they led the league in rollover, well, I think the 49ers were just ahead of them. They seem to be a team, unfortunately, a, a good, well-run team, that are sniffing what the Browns are doing and sensing it, which uh, is less than helpful. I wish it was a, a struggling team in the league and not someone with like Shanahan on the sideline. Um, but they're, they're following that. They're two of the teams with the most rollover into next year, and they'll just constantly roll it over. You don't just create all this space to spend it now. You have your structure and you just roll over extra money year on year. No, that's that's brilliant. And obviously when they restructure Jerry Judy's contract, it leaves more room to go buy, uh, you know, go spend on more players and put more money in their pockets. I think it's a beautiful thing. It's actually almost a benefit to the player because the player is getting more cash in their pocket now. And then from my standpoint, you can go make investments. You can go do all, all the sorts of things that 
I harp on on this show. So that's the biggest reason I'm super interested is how we get more money in the players' pockets now. Speaking of money in players' pockets, there's a guy on your team that has a whole lot of money in his pocket. And we said we don't have to get into his play whatsoever. The contract, the trade, the guarantees, the Sean Watson, I know you talked about it at, at length. Is he going to restructure his contract? Where do you see them going in the quarterback? Uh, you know, where's this? Where's the crystal ball and Deshaun Watson play out there? Yeah. So when they gave him the deal, I had no real concern because we have to go back to Peyton Manning with the Colts was the last time a sort of top sixteen quarterback that was paid at that time then got cut and didn't see out the end of their deal because we remember sort of the, the Jared Goff stuff where everyone's like, oh, Jared Goff's broken. The Rams will get rid of him. And, and at the time, people thought he was just getting traded to the Lions and instantly cut. And it was almost the Brock Osweiler stuff that we saw with the Browns. And he's gone on to have great success. So it's one where it was a real anomaly. You have to go back to um, Peyton Manning getting cut. And then he ended up getting more money after his cut anyway when he went to the Broncos. But it's so rare for a quarterback not to succeed and teams to want to get rid of him. Obviously, Russ is now the most recent example. So semi-guaranteed anyway quarterback deals for a long time because Kirk Cousins, all of these guys, Kirk Cousins signed multiple fully guaranteed deals. You just didn't throw your quarterback out. And that's why I never had a sort of concern at the time because I was like, hey, if he's top 16, we're going to keep him. Happy days. Everything's fine. We've obviously seen two years where through suspension and sort of not great play, there was some really positive stuff at the end. You find out the best game he played was with one shoulder, which is just insane that that news then came out afterwards. And you're like, yes, all the Browns fans were like, he's come, it's finally turned around. It's all looking great. And it's all a mess now. But I expect them just push all of those salary cap hits out because some people are like, oh, don't do it now. Take the full cap hit. My view is very much just like, I would rather not deal with 64 million for the next three years and then seven. I'd rather deal with the three short, smallest cap hits and then we'll have like 89 off the top of my head in 2027 when he's off the roster. Because that way, the salary cap in four years' time is going to be significantly higher than it is now. So push everything and deal with it then. Um, and there's no sort of downside to doing it that way. If you can get his camp to a, put in like a one-day contract um, for that sixth season and then post-June 1st cut him, that's even easier for cap management. Will his team be willing to do that? Who knows? But um, you can certainly ask. There's all sorts of tips and tricks. And, and could you explain, I guess, to the viewers that post-June cut, we see it everywhere now. Um, players actually do get cut and can go seek employment from other teams. It's just an accounting method. Can you explain that to us? Yeah. So what used to kind of happen in the past um, is they would hold a player all the way until the 2nd of June because after the 1st of June, if a player's cut, their current year of proration, um, sort of signing bonus money sits in this year and then the rest moves into next year. Um, because as we gave the example of like, you sign someone for 1 million, um, give them a 10 million signing bonus, 3 million in this year, and effectively it's 2 million in each of the next years. So in that second year, rather than hitting sort of 8 million on the cap in dead cap, you could say, I'll deal with, 2 million in the second year. And then in the third year, I'll deal with the 6 million there. And it's just a case of pushing that money out even further. So it's just to help teams navigate the cap. And it was really good move by the NFLPA of going, hey, we'll support this because it puts more money into players' pockets. The more you can enable and allow teams to be aggressive, like the Browns, the Saints, the um, Eagles, the Saints more in the past than now, but give them mechanisms to sort of circumvent the cap. It's not cheating the system because every dollar that's given to a player has to land on there someday. But the more freedom you give teams to be aggressive, the more money gets past the players. So I would love to see a post-June 1st trade designation because that's something the league doesn't have now. And you could get really wild in the trade market then where teams are much more willing to trade for players because you can push that hit really far into the future. All right. Well, you hear that NFLPA. Let's get that post uh, June designation for trades. And then also, I know Andrew Barry mentioned pushing it back to the trade deadline. 
What do we think about that? Just again, and as another mechanism later on in the year where teams have needs to just the more trades and the more activity we can have, the better it is for players. Or is there a butterfly effect there? I think it's just more fun. It's more yeah. entertaining and yeah. you, you can leave it till later. So it probably doesn't affect too much what players going to get paid. But what it does do, it just creates excitement around the league. If you're a player and suddenly you're on a team, you might be the star player and the team's done for the season. You're going to be a free agent at the end of the year. And they go, hey, do you want to go play on the Chiefs? The Chiefs lost a, a wide receiver. Do you want to go play there? That team can go, well, we'd have got a third round comp pick in two years time. Give us the third rounder now. Take the rest of the contract on. We're then up. We get our pick a year earlier. Yeah. You can get what you need. And as well, if if you're tanking towards the end of the season, someone wants to take your star player that's leaving on a free, just helps the tank a little bit more. And as well, you could have young wide receivers that you want to give opportunities to, but the great star that is constantly taking the targets quite rightly because the team and the coaches starts focused on winning – and it just opens up more stuff. So I think moving it later is better because it allows teams to know that they're out of the playoffs. Because when Andrew yeah. Berry was speaking at the Combine, it was shocking. It was like only three teams kind of know they're out of the playoffs officially when the trade deadline strikes. Whereas if you can get that up a bit more, more teams are knowing, hey, my season's done. I may as well trade this guy off. So that makes a ton of sense. All right. Well, I'm, I'm a part of the NFLPA. So I'm bringing up that post-June designation for trades and also pushing back the trade deadline. I think I am a fan of that. So we talked enough about the receivers, the quarterback. I think let's talk about the heart and soul of the team, Nick Chubb, coming off a you know a devastating injury. I know there's been a lot of chatter with him and his contract. Where do we see that going? So they're in a similar boat with Jack Conklin a couple of years ago, the Browns, where he was coming off an injury. He was due 12 million in that final year, but no guarantees. Um, and that's a risky position for a player where there's no protection for them, um, really, and, and they don't know what's going to happen. The team could play hardball. Um, and what the Browns did, they said, hey, we'll guarantee 8 million of your 12, and then we're going to give you incentives where you can earn the four back, but then we don't have to account for it for the time being on the, the salary cap. Yeah, it's considered um, not likely to be earned in the accounting, in the accounting books. Which is... I get why they do it that way. So not likely to be earned is, did they do it last year? So if Patrick Mahomes has a, an incentive based on winning the Super Bowl um, and some crazy stuff, he is. if he has an incentive on winning the Super Bowl, it's likely to happen in, in terms of the way the incentives work, which I, I'm, I'm not going to doubt him, but that's the sort of bar that it hits um, there. And what, I expect them to do is probably a similar thing with Nick Chubb, where they go to him and say, hey, we're going to guarantee a portion of this, and then we'll give you incentives to earn the rest back, just because it builds a good relationship. Um, the advantage is how the running back market's moved, because I always felt it would Nick Chubb get a second deal in Cleveland, because the way it looked like the market was going sort of when he was drafted with the Christian McCaffrey sort of first deal with the Panthers, it was like, I, I can't see them extending him. And then the market sort of flatlined and went down a little. And it was like, hey, it's now in your favor. And Eagles were shock horror. They've been sort of the leaders of don't pay a single running back, build a committee. But there's always a point where suddenly it flips and it's like, no, it's worth getting someone now. And they've gone and done that with Saquon. They've obviously felt that now the market's at a point where it's beneficial to have one of these players. You don't want to pay him 20 million, but 12 and a half, it's like, hey, that that's a really, really good investment. Um, and that's the thing that some people get really frustrated about. When I talk about, they're like, oh, just pay that guy, whatever. It's like, if Miles Garrett was earning 50 million a year, I would want Miles Garrett off my team. That's not saying Miles Garrett's a phenomenal player, but he's also not 50 million. And that's something that, you're judging player based on their contract and what they're earning. Someone could be a phenomenal player, but they're being paid twice the amount they should. That's where problems arise. And, uh, and there needed to be get. somewhat of a correction in that running back market. And maybe eventually there's a correction in the quarterback market because we're seeing those, those contracts start to go. Unfortunately, the running backs were ones that, and I think there, there, there's going to be a butterfly effect there as well. And I talked to Eric eager about this is maybe somehow allowing rookie running backs to get to that second contract quicker. But how does that impact where they get drafted? There's a lot there, but maybe in the next CBA, they try to figure out a way to help positions like that, like a linebacker or a running back. Now you're, you're, you talked about the Eagles and yeah, go ahead. 
I'm going to put a request in for you at the NFLPA to put this one forward. Positions. Like, can they fix positions? Because the idea that TJ Watt is a linebacker and it's like, can we, can we just make edge and linebacker yeah. proper positions? And it even split up tackle and interior O-line because um, it was really rare for like a guard to get tagged because they were thrown in with the... Uh, well, I suppose it probably works in your favour if the guards aren't getting tagged. So ignore that one. Yes. Um, but definitely the linebacker edge stuff. It's just, it's infuriating when you're talking about like, oh, this guy's an edge. and Because it, it, most people now that cover the league talk about edge because Miles Garrett and TJ Watt are similar positions. Whereas the league tells us that like JOK and TJ Watt are the same position. It's like, well, no, they're not. It makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, it brings me back to a guy that the Giants just traded for, Brian Burns. What is his position? Is he a 4-3 defensive end? Is he a 3-4 outside linebacker? When I'm playing left tackle, I'm looking out there like, we're blocking this guy. Like, that's all that I need to if, – if the offensive lineman looks out there and goes, hey, that guy is a certified problem and we need to account for him, he needs to get tagged as a defensive end. How do you feel – and Brian Burns is the most recent example, and I know my Giants fans are out there – and. They're they're sad about Saquon and they're happy about Brian Burns. You look at what the Giants did, trading the pick, similar to what the Browns did. They gave up a, a little bit more of uh, you know, a little bit more of a haul with a second and a fifth, but then signing him to that massive contract. How do you view that? Because as you mentioned, you can't get the premium position players in free agency because they don't get there. Yeah. So if this had been two firsts, I would be like, like what the Rams offered, are just slating it because I hate giving up the idea that you're giving up one really cheap high pick, another really cheap high pick, and then you're giving up, say, 25 million of cash that you could spend in free agency on other guys. So you're effectively giving up like four quality players to get one guy and then pay him. And that's why I just, I can't stand that in roster building. I get it can be really hard to go out and get sort of a great edge, but at the same time, if you could get, so Darius Smith, um, Eric Armstead, and then you get two first round picks. I think you can get enough sort of devastation on your D line to balance out what one player can do. When you're talking about a second and a fifth, it then I think the market's recorrecting over what we've seen in the past of like um, Jamal Adams going for two first. It was like that's just it's too aggressive. No player can really give you two first of potential plus the extra money that you're going to spend outside of a quarterback. So I don't know if the market's just kind of catching up and teams are going, yeah, maybe that was a bit too much and it's too much investment in one guy. Um, whereas a second and fifth, I, I, I could stomach that um, because a fifth so late and a second, a second to sign him because can you get a player of that caliber in free agency? Probably not when you're on a bit of a, a downward trajectory. If you're one of the, the top five teams and players really want to come and play with you, it's a different argument. But if you don't have that quarterback, it can be tricky to uh, recruit good players. Not that it stopped the Giants this year. They've, they've actually had quite a nice uh, all of guys they've brought in. Um, Illuminor, is that how you pronounce his yeah. name? He's a UK um, guy, I, I, right? I, I really like that signing. He was one that if, if the Browns last year... Um, didn't extend Conklin. He was a guy that I've said a few times, I was like, hey, I, I would have quite liked him in there. He could come in and do a really, really good job on your right flank. So uh, no, I've had my eye on him for a few years, but the Browns haven't had the need to go out and sign him. No, 100%. I, I look at it like the, the Giants had let Xavier McKinney walk, let Saquon Barkley walk. They bring in Brian Burns. They bring in John Runyon Jr., who's a guard. They're paying him $10 million a year. You bring in Jermaine Almuna. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher the name too, and he's my boy. Um, you, uh, you say you say it for me. Illuminor, Illuminor, Elmuninor, something like that. Jermaine, we got to get you on the show because you can correct me because I'm butchering it up, man. And we're gonna we love you and we love what you're bringing to the, to the New York Giants. But you can bring in three players for what you may have, have, have paid Apple for. So I think that definitely starts to play into that aspect of where you want to move the money around to. Hopefully, and I'm very hopeful, the Giants and Joe Shane. Mr. Mayor, the Tishes, all the ownership, see what I'm talking about on this episode with you. And the Giants can start trending in that direction. Um, so overall, as you look through this, 
how much money in dollar amount, and I know you, you you sent this to me previously, if every team spent like the Browns did for the last three years, how much money would be extra in players' pockets if we could get every team to spend like the Browns did? So if every team spent like the Browns over the last three years, I want to pull this number up just so I get it exactly. I think we're talking about 1.4 billion, uh, sorry, that's nowhere close. 4.2 billion extra for players over the last three years. That, that's, that's insane. That is insane. So you think about it, the league generates $20 billion a year and that trickles down to owners and players. If we could get every team to spend, like the Cleveland Browns are, are spending right now, $4.2 billion dollars, 20% of what the league makes on a year's basis goes back into our pockets. And then we figure out what to do with it from there. We're just talking about, we'll grow the pie. We'll do all these different things. But if we can just spend and use the cap and cash to our advantage, we can put an extra $4.2 billion in players' pockets. I don't think anyone is going to argue that. You're going to have more production on the field. The entertainment value goes up. All the fantasy numbers and all these different things go higher and higher. I think it really adds to the, the dynamics. We could even maybe take those dollars and go start another team in Europe. We need to get it. We need to crowdsource a, a way to get a team out there. Do you think that the NFL could sustain in the UK or another place in Europe? I think it certainly could. Um, I wonder if they would try and put a division out here, uh, maybe a team here, a team in Germany, um, a couple somewhere else, just because it would probably make it easier. Um, just scheduling and like, hey, bring a team over and they they play two and then they fly back um, would make sense. I wonder if partly they're eyeing up as a bridge to that of but like having a 17th game each year where it doesn't just have to be abroad. It could be neutral in the States. It could be in Canada. Um, it could be anywhere where there's a big enough stadium to hold it, but it just take it almost on a, a circuit and go, hey, that we'll play eight home, eight away and one neutral and then really just use it to expand the coverage because I'm sure that, that when I first got into American football and you look up the biggest stadiums and you're like, I haven't heard of most of these teams and then you find out they're college teams. It was such a surprise because you just don't get that in the UK. It's like you've got the top tier and then you've got tiny stadiums and it it, it was a different world and that's a place where there's so many sites, stadiums that they could go to across the US and take a game, but they can go global as well. So that could be a bridge potentially in between. Um, but yeah, I, I think it would certainly sustain one. I think it would be weird though, because I don't expect lots of fans to instantly change to supporting that team. Um, because if you go and watch a game in the UK, it's just a sea of different colored jerseys yeah. um, because we all rock up where in whatever team we support, we're just there for a day out. Yeah, I think I, you know, when I was in the Giants in 2016, we went to Twickenham and played the, the Rams out there. And it was just a sea of, of jerseys from Green Bay to the Patriots to Giants. It was a Rams home game, but the fans were more on the New York Giants side, I think, just because New York City was more of a, a, a sell than maybe St. Louis was at the time. Oh, it's a mixture of where they've been on holiday and who was in the Super Bowl the year before. So they are the two biggest factors for like, where's the injection of teams coming from? Okay, perfect. All right. I'm going to end this with a few questions. We had put some things out on Twitter and we picked one of them. Um, Spark Scouting asks, the people of X would love to know, other than the Browns, who does Jack think is ahead of the curve when it comes to the salary cap versus cap cash spending? I think we have that one. Um, you want to you go ahead and answer it just so we can we can say we did it? Uh, it's Eagles for me, um, right up there. Um, but yeah, if we look over the last three years, I'll just do the top three. It's Browns, Jets and Ravens. So some surprise in there. Obviously, the older Lamar Jackson deal helped uh, spike the Ravens up. No, 100%. Well, Jack, I really appreciate it. Before we wrap this up, can you let all my followers know out there where they can find you, how to stay connected? I think we're going to be bridging some, I think there's some some real unique opportunities to, to present some ideas to the Giants and Cardinals fan bases. I think if maybe you did a little side hustle where maybe you, you broke down some of those cat things or maybe recommendations if you were those GMs. Maybe we found a business. You could just, you could just take what you're already doing and take it on the road. But where can everyone find you? Yeah, so Twitter's always the best place. Um, so it's at Jack Duffin, uh, J-A-C-K-D-U-F-F-I-N. Um, all my written work is over at the Orange and Brown Report, um, but it's all linked. It's easier just follow me on Twitter. And if the top articles and the really interesting stuff and the main article that we've discussed today, that's pinned in my uh, Twitter as the top post. 
Um, so just jump in there and give that a read. And yeah, we spoke about the football club. I'm going to, I'm going to take a chance to plug that soccer team. If you're interested in the sport, just become an owner. It means the absolute world to me, uh, running a club. We've got, uh, we're in 10 different countries now, double digits in the U S you guys over there have been phenomenal with becoming owners. We've got 167 owners off the top of my head. Um, so yeah, the more people that join really makes the world a difference. Us setting up something that is a uh, unique and exciting, but no, it's, it's been a mad journey sort of covering stuff in the NFL the last few years. And thanks so much. It was, it was weird when you popped up on Twitter, I was like, Oh, this person's got an icon that is a player. And then I, I clicked on it just to be like, is this just this guy's favorite player? And it was like, no, this is a real person that played in the NFL. Um, and yeah, that, that was cool. So thanks for reaching out. And it's, been fantastic just to kind of have a chat. No, it's been amazing. You, when you told me that we could put an extra $4.2 billion in players' pockets and you know how I knew me and you had to get together and, and have this. So everybody go follow Jack. Go go invest in the team. Go throw a couple bucks into it. You get a, you get a not a Premier League team, but eighth division? Twelfth. Twelfth division. But hey, that's where the hard is. That, we're going up day by day. We're going to be in the Premier League before it's all said and done. What's the name of the team? So it's East Thurrock Community Football Club. Uh, that's another thing that you guys aren't used to, promotion and relegation. Yeah, we, we have to win enough games and then we go up to the next tier. So there's nothing stopping us going to the Premier League. It's going to take an awful, awful lot of money, but let, let's go for like, let's try to get up to the sixth tier. That would be the absolute dream. Um, but let's make it happen. Perfect. I love that. Uh, make sure you go follow Jack on Twitter. You can follow along and see how, you know, Brown's news. I think he, he, he provides such a great impact and, and, and insight on how the salary cap is used and how your team could use it. Um, make sure you're subscribing, you're liking to this channel, Net Worth. And as long as you guys are subscribing, we will keep bringing on guests like Jack and get this insight out there. This is an awesome conversation today, Jack. I really appreciate it. Look forward uh, to continue to follow along on your journey. Hopefully when the NFL comes to Europe, they're going to be calling you first to be running that team. You're already going to have some uh, insight on running the soccer club. So I'm, I'm super excited and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.